London Satyr takes place in 1891, at the very end of an age which was crumbling, whose structures, whose moral, economic and social structures were beginning to crumble. The Victorians were never as moralistic as we, we tend to think they were. They simply had a better structure and way of coping with their own moralising. The book involves a photographer who works at the Lyceum Theatre with Henry Irving and Bram Stoker, who was Irving's manager. And what the photographer does is he steals props and clothes and gives them to a pornographer who then uses them in his photo shoots and then sells on the photos, which are obviously worth a lot more money because they've got the dresses worn by famous actresses, including Ellen Terry. And in the middle of the book, a couple of events take place, one in the wider world, one in the man's own world, own world, which bring him into conflict not only with his employers but with his wife and daughter. Uh, and make, make him, he has to reconsider what he's doing, but by then it's far too late. And what I wanted at the centre of this book was an invisible character. Marlowe is only ever seen through the eyes of the five or six people around him. The five or six people who, when something terrible happens at the heart of the novel, he has to make a getaway. Those six people are the first six people to fall behind him. And they've all got to work out their own strategies out of, the, out of this dilemma. But the, what you realise as you read the book is that the pornographer is an invisible man and that he disappears in stages and that he's left part of himself on everyone else around him, men and women included. I think what makes the novel interesting are the people in it. And sometimes you can distract yourself from those people. There is, for, is, for instance, reference to Jack the Ripper, but it's only a single set, you know, someone says, oh, that Whitechapel business, because people wouldn't have sat analysing it like we may do today. They would simply refer to it as, you know, a bit of passing news, perhaps. I create a historical background. I've, I've written a succession of historical novels now, and I always find it is very useful. I never really... Uh, the, the historical background is, is, is all too often clumsily inserted. It's often more important to know tiny incidents, tiny details. I was interested in creating the historical background with a, a certain degree of knowledge in the reader. You can't set a book in 1913 in the modern world without the reader knowing the First World War is about to start. You can't set a book the day before 9-11 without that having a great shadow cast on it. And I quite like the fact that most, most readers nowadays imagine that they know what the late Victorian period was like. We can't confuse it with the 1830s and 40s, and we can't confuse it with Dickensian Victoria. It's the, it's the one, of my, one of my sort of great favourites as a writer is, is Conrad, Joseph Conrad. And I like the fact that he was trying to write modern novels at the same time. It's why the, it's why the pornographer in my book's called Marlowe. You know, I like giving fairly big clues, but, but the little clues aren't important sometimes. The clues about what people ate and drank in Victorian England. How did they travel? How did they move around? Because I, I still think they were you and me. They were people who knew how to love, hate, be jealous, be envious, be frightened. They were no different, just as people in novels set a thousand years in the future are no different. I think what makes the novel interesting are the people in it, and sometimes you can distract yourself from those people. There is, for, is, for instance, reference to Jack the Ripper, but it's only a single set, you know, someone says, oh, that Whitechapel business, because people wouldn't have sat analysing it like we may do today. They would simply refer to it as, you know, a bit of passing news, perhaps. Uh, so I like to keep the I, I do keep it as light as possible, the historical. I, my, I have to say my first drafts are inc invariably twice as long as the finished book. And I suspect a lot of the historical stuff, if it doesn't carry its weight, it goes in that first major revision. I like the austerity of writing. I like the hard work because it's an hour and a half, two hours a day for two months, beginning of September to the end of October. I enjoy Christmas too much to work in December. And then I, it's usually so cold and icy and snowy where I live that January, February, March, I can sit down with my two fingers and a computer keyboard. But I'm not very computer literate still. It's incredibly slow. But it, it's part of the process now. If I can't be bothered to type out an adjective or an adverb, I simply don't. And the critics say, God, it's marvellous. He has such a glacial style. He pars it down to the absolute minimum and it works fabulously well. They don't realise I just can't be bothered to type in the word tall, dark. <laughs> I just go straight to the handsome.